We're burning the midnight oil tonight, trying to get this project wrapped up, and that means it's time for dyno tuning. Tony at UMS Tuning is gonna get down and work his magic with the AM Infinity. So let's see how this all goes. So Tony, where do we start here? Um, well, this, all the starting happened uh, a week and a half ago when I built the base map. <laughs> Right, so you didn't have to go through actually building a map for this because it is a fully custom ECU. You much I shouldn't say custom ECU, but custom map. Custom, custom application, but either, even so, on every car, this is where we start. You know, like one of the critical elements I asked you was uh, uh, bore and stroke, because everyone rounds up their their uh, displacement, and uh, right. in a VE-based ECU, that's one of the critical measurements you have in the precise uh, measurement, yeah, yeah, yeah. because that because that's this is determines your airflow. And yeah. So, you know, I asked you for a board stroke. Well, this is actually a 3.37. It's not a 3.4, right? As I originally it's told you, yeah. It's not that big of a deal, but it matters. You yeah. know, it matters. And, uh, you know, it's a six cylinder, it's a four stroke. It's a sequential coil unplug setup. There's our firing order. Uh, we're going to we're gonna be calculating the airflow based on BE. And our spark and uh, VE table maps are based off of pressure, which is map. Um, that's the, the, the initial things you do. Tuning preferences, this, is, this has something to do with the internal software things. Right. Camry crank sensor, there's no uh, specific wizard used, but it's a, a trigger pattern that's existing in the software. Uh, the injectors, we have Injector Dynamics 1000 CC injectors. Uh, we're using gasoline as opposed to flex fuel or methanol or ethanol or yep. something direct. Um, we assign uh, each injector to a, a, a wide band sensor since we, this is a single turbo car. It's all based on Lambda 1, uh -huh. uh, our injector phasing. Whether we have primary or secondary injectors, if we only have six, we are all primary. Uh, here's our basic sensors. We have our air temp sensor. We have a calibration in there that we selected. It's one of the AEM. Uh, yeah, uh, we've got a lot series. of actual sensors installed, we right? We do, and that's what makes this, this ECU work really well because it uses all of them. Uh, coolant temp is actually something that we kind of uh, fudge together. It's actually a, a Bosch-based sensor, but it's uh, the calibration for it is, is uh, goes beyond our normal temperature range. This is so head. this is this the one that's the this is our this is our what we call our coolant temp because that's what most engine management systems use for our warm up procedures and so on and so forth. But we don't have coolant in this car, right? <laughs> and oil temp doesn't come up fast enough to use that as coolant temp, so we use head temp. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it's a pretty good in indicator of whether or not the motor's warmed up. It's similar to port temperature, which is right used on. in some okay. some modeling. So this is more for warm up. It's 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 for you know the colder the engine is, the more fuel it needs. Right. Uh, there has the more airflow it needs for idle. There's a lot of a lot of variables uh -huh. that are involved with based on the temperature of the engine. Uh, so basically, it's used for warm up. Once we reach a certain threshold, it's pretty much linear beyond that, for the most part. Gotcha. And we kind of flatten it out there. Our map starts. That's our primary load. We're using an AEM three and a half bar, so we're capable of going two and a half bar positive pressure. Yeah. And I guess that's a nice thing with using all the AEM products together. You've kind of got a proven setup. Certainly. The, yeah, yeah. With the Infinity. All the uh, all all the sensor calibrations are already there. We're using a fuel pressure sensor, which is one of the coolest features of this ECU, is that uh, uh, we're actually calculating our fuel fuel flow based on the pressure sensor. So what that means is that wow, I didn't know that. So what that means is that uh, at any given point in time, there's our fuel pressure right now, right? Yep. Well, our injectors flow different flow at different pressures. Well, most ECUs don't have a a correlation to that, so you're basically working on on data cells worth of uh, a predetermined point pressure versus RPM, right? Right. This gives us an additional, additional factor here. This, at right now we're at somewhere 36, or we're in between these two cells, we're at 36 PSI of uh, fuel pressure, and our actual injector flow rate right now is 780 s something. Yeah, units, whatever. Uh, CCs per C minute. Oh, CCs, okay. Yeah, so with that being said, we know exactly how much fuel is entering the motor. Therefore, this VE number, this is a volumetric efficiency, this is how well the cylinder filling happens. Okay. You know, right now, assuming all the other numbers are precise, we're filling the cylinder about 59 to 60, actually, if you look down here, we're at 58% efficiency right now with the oh, closed that's throttle. that's so neat, yeah. So that's the efficiency of the engine, and using that, this information, the computer calculates how much fuel to feed the engine. Yeah. It's no longer a simple 2D table where you plug in your RPM and your load and a, a fixed pulse width. It's no longer based on that. It's based on an actual airflow number, an X amount of air and Y amount of fuel. 
and, and that makes it more it efficient, makes it, makes it easier to more tune. More efficient, smoother. I mean, I spend no time tuning. Uh, I can rev it. I can rev it out because it's basic. It's very fundamental math. There. Cool. The other bonus is that say you have a problem with your fuel system, pressure starts dropping. Well, it knows the pressure, so as long as it's within the capabilities of the injector, it will attempt to feed oh, enough fuel. Oh wow! So it can adjust if it, the fuel pressure goes up or can, goes down. It does. It does constantly. Yeah. Wow. That's the cool. That's that's like my favorite feature about it. So if I have a one of my pump dies, I have a safety feature in here. So yeah, I was just going to ask. It, I'm it, sure there's a ton of safety features. Yeah, there are. So if it gets into, below right? 0.8 lambda, above 225 kPa, we hit a fuel cut. You know? Wow, okay. So, you know, at leaner, at, at, at diesel and things like that, we can go pretty lean, it's not a big deal. As load goes up, we command, we're commanding a richer mixture than that. Yeah. That is our lean limit. So if I see a Lambda that lean, I want the ECU to do something about it. And I, can make, right. I can make it do a check engine light, I can make it do a secondary limiter, yeah. combination of both. Same with oil pressure, which we have that in here as well. It's another cool feature. Uh, when the oil pressure comes outside of this window, it'll hit a fuel cut. No kidding. Yeah, I could do the same that. with oil, oil temp, and I'm not entirely sure we have oil temp on this, uh, on your car, but I can do the same thing for oil temp, yeah, I can do, and do the same thing for coolant temp, which is actually what we were fighting earlier, is I had this 120C data point as yeah, zero, yeah. so it was cutting the car. Um, because obviously it thought it was overheating, but... That's not, it is overheating on a, on a coolant on temp, a coolant but based on, car, a, so yeah. on our head temp it's not, so all yeah, we have to we scale that, and... and uh, Make yeah. that be a more attainable number. See, I always knew the Infinity had a ton of safety features, but now seeing this, it makes so much more sense to me. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I, I I run this on my own car not because it was given to me. It wasn't. I bought it. Right. Yeah. You know. I mean, obviously they've they've been involved in my racing program for a couple of years now, and, and they've been greatly supportive. But at the end of the day, I bought the ECU. Yeah. It's my, because you know, it's a good ECU. Because of the features you involved. Trusted. Yeah. Correct. And that's the same reason why you know I continue to use it too. Even though I'm not tuning it, I've, we've had <laughs> we've had such good uh, support from AAM, and on top of that, success with their ECUs. So yeah, absolutely. I, I trust it with this, you know, thirty thousand dollar engine here. Um, you know, like these cars generally at one bar of boost, they'll they'll want to see anywhere between nineteen and twenty three degrees of timing. Right, but we're just um, going to start off significantly below that because I'm. I'm going to be ma mapping the fuel. I don't, I'm not looking for the limits of the timing. The timing affects fueling hardly at all. It's very, very minimal. I got you. It does affect it, but it's very, very small amount. Yep. So we start out with a real timid timing number and let the thing be happy there. And then we can go through and map the fuel. Yeah. The fueling. And so tell me this. What do you think about the engine breaking? Because I know the internet's going to be like, whoa, uh, you didn't break the engine in. Is yeah, this, how yeah, are you breaking yeah. the engine in? Well, I, I got a, I got a, uh, a real a realistic uh, View upon it. Um, I've seen OEs assemble cars and, and deliver cars. Uh, Their braking procedure is nothing. They spin the exact, yeah, yeah. and they look for a, a torque resistance on the crankshaft. Uh -huh. Some manufacturers do that. Some some do other methods. But uh, um, there's no race engine on the planet that is driven around uh, around Very on true. the street for 500 miles. None of them do. So there's uh, I, I have a, a basic procedure, and, and realistically, the way I deal like with it is I, I go I go through heat cycles. We we I have. But the guys run the motors and get through two, three heat cycles. Oil changes everything along the way to make sure everything's clean, everything's happy, and seated. Long before good heat cycles will get that happening. Long before it makes it a dyno. Once we're on a dyno, I'm doing part throttle loading all the way up through. Usually, I do about 60% of the RPM range of the motor. Yeah. So, you know, this car will probably go to about 4,500 to 5,000 RPM, and I'm doing steady state. It's a fixed RPM, but I'm very load. Move to the next RPM for very load. So by the time we get through to that higher RPM point, we've not only have we been through about five solid heat cycles, yeah. we've also very low RPM, yeah. very load. So essentially breaking the engine All of this has happened extent. already. After that, we'll let it cool down for a little bit, and then we'll start making sweeps and hits. Yeah. Makes total sense. The beauty of it is we're using uh, Lambda as our uh, air fuel uh, unit, yeah. and uh, our VE is uh, a percentage of of uh, cylinder filling. So basically, if we have an error of, right now we have an error of 2%, we're 2% rich. I pulled 2% out of our VE, and our fuel trim goes to, actually, let's drift it up. 
That's so neat. So we'll put 2% out of it and it'll basically stabilize so with itself. So with tuning, it, do you find it's easier to tune or difficult? What it's easier. Say? It's definitely easier. It, uh, it's a lot, uh, well, let me rephrase that. It's easier to finalize a tune. It's a lot more time consuming to initially set it up because of all everything, the data that you have everything's to put critical, in. everything matters. Yeah. You don't just put fake numbers in there. Yeah, it's critical. Yeah. Whereas uh, a cell by cell, uh, you know, pulse width type of uh, an ECU, yeah. you can fudge all of it. You have fuel pressure tapering at the end, you fudge it. You yeah. Know, like in a, in a situation like this, it's it always known that everything's there. So you have all the data, and the moment you see something wrong, like, oh, we're stopping right now. Yeah. You know, because there's a, there's a critical problem. We're going to fix that. So if you get everything right here, you make any mathematical change, it's a mathematical change. Gotcha. I change my injector size, I just plug that in. Uh -huh. I don't have to change my fuel tables. Whereas you, you do that with a. So a, it's pretty much like building a really good base. Once you have that, exactly. Well, that's exactly how the OEs do it. The OEs do everything perfect. That's why you can just grab an ECU off the shelf and drop a calibration yeah, there. Know, the cars drive. Yeah. You know because everything's mathematically correct. Huh. You know you start changing everything on the car. It's no longer mathematically correct. I got you. That's why yeah, you have to yeah, get yeah, them yeah. tuned. It comes to us. Makes you know? sense. Yep. So we just finished up, or you finished up, doing all the fueling, right? Yep. We got a, the table has a couple of odd little steps in it, but this flat manifold, uh, old school 930 manifold, yeah, will have right, weird right, reversion. Right, right. I got gotcha. you. So that's probably what this giant spike is right here. The rest of it should follow V pretty closely. So what we'll do at this point, we're going to make a make a, a pull on the wastegate spring. Yep. With our super timid timing numbers and see what the fueling tells us about our curvature if it's spread up. further out where I didn't want to go All right, well, I'm ready when you are. horsepower and 346 ish on how much boost was that? Uh, I don't think it was keeping the boost. That came up at 6 feet high and it came up about 11 Yeah, wow, that's it's probably due to our low timing numbers that are pretty good. I got you. But yeah. uh, we'll, we'll see what happens here. Yeah. That's Still not bad though. No, not normal at all. Especially considering these things barely crack that. With the CIS injection. You can barely touch three of the CIS yeah. injections and you start doing stuff at them. Yeah. I don't know if you can see this, but we've got a bit of an oil leak. So our dyno session has been cut short because of one of the, what did you say, the cam tower? Uh, it's chain, uh, chain box plug. Chain box plug came loose. So we've had to stop. It's kind of getting late, right? Yeah. And uh, we'll resume tomorrow, but Tell me what you see so far from the dyno chart. All right, so right now we're uh, we're on the wastegate spring. Um, so it takes longer to build boost. Uh, it, not really. It builds boost the same at the same rate, but it okay. opens up when it wants to open up, and you know pa bypasses the amount of exhaust gases it, it wants to bypass. So what's happening here is I think we're going to find that our peak boost happens somewhere around 4,500. I think uh, uh, 5,000. Yeah, and it kind of cruises along flat from 5,200 on. Yeah, okay. Our gate is actually open around 2750, which is super low. Um, so realistically, if we, were, if we were using boost control, electronic boost control, we should probably be able to carry this and hit this 11 PSI somewhere around here, around wow, 3100 so maybe. 3100, yeah. I, I would think we could, we, could, we could probably pull that off Yeah. Um, and then carry it flat. And realistically, we'd, on pump gas, we'd easily get away with this really low compression motor. We'd get away with uh, 16 to 18 pounds all day gotcha. on 91. Um, so what, you notice, what you're going to notice is that 5250, our peak boost levels out and our torque falls hard beyond that. Part of that's because of a shitty old two-valve head, 
part of it's because we have a really small turbo on this thing. It's a okay. you know a 30 R turbine wheel. It is an 82 uh, open T3 housing, but we got three point nearly 3.4 liters flowing through it, so it's a lot of vo exhaust volume. Um, so essentially, we're already seeing that the 3076. It's going to plateau, it's but you know I think it, it, this this torque area right here, from here to here is going to fill in pretty nicely. I think it's going to come upward and round out as we're probably going to hit peak torque closer to the 4,000 mark. Yeah. And it's going to carry fairly well to about 55 and nose over Wicked. really hard. Huh? That's what we're going to see. I'm going to bet we're going to be able to do 415, 425 out of this. Okay. Might be my guess. Yeah. And realistically, we'll probably hit 375, maybe 380 foot-pounds of torque out of, out of it as well. Yeah, that's not bad. Uh, which won't be bad. It's going to hit hard, but it's going to nose over up top. We won't have the legs at that. Uh, that's the 35R will. The 35R will carry better up top. I'm, I'm really curious to see the so, difference. Uh, well, well, the thing is, we get, we get our, our fueling damn near there. Um, we're pretty close. I'm having some uh, some uh, fuel pressure noise in this area and map sensor noise as well. Again, likely uh, caused by our, our old... Uh, three liter uh, intake manifold that's really flat. So basically your port opening, your valve tip's about three inches from a 90 degree bend inside the manifold. I got you, yeah, So yeah. it causes a lot of noise and re reverb. Which is reverberation in the electrical system or well, is it? Well, it, it could be both. It, 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 since I see it in the map sensor and the fuel, fuel pressure sensor, it quite possibly could be uh, uh, Manifold pressure is actually I fluctuating. Got you. So like it's a that. weird kind of yeah, point. Yeah, it's a resonant point. Yeah, ah, it's okay. a weird resonant point. So it's nothing point. electronic. So I'm, I'm softening it up. I, I actually, you can see from one pull to, to the next pull, I softened up the uh, the reaction of it, kind of dampened the signal. Yeah. And it's flattened it out quite a bit. It's not quite as noisy. But there's still this, I think this drop off is map sensor, and this is all fuel pressure. So fuel pressure is filtered out. Now I add a little bit of filtering to the map sensor, and I should think we'll be okay with that. Okay. So uh, once we fix our little uh, uh, <laughs> visible uh, oil level, oil leak, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, fix <laughs> we'll, that. Uh, we'll be able to continue on and uh, and find uh, right. the limits of this turbo and uh, put what belongs on here as a 35R. That's right. So I got a 40R sitting on the shelf. Uh, I think I think the 35R is going to be as good as it uh, <laughs> it is for me. So, all right. Well, we'll be back very soon for part two, numero dos tomorrow. If you guys want to support what we're up to here, you can check out our Patreon page. And if you don't, that's cool too. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs>